Well, it's a great joy to be here with you today and to serve on behalf of my friend, Pastor Josh. And uh, true or false, you live in perhaps the most amazing place to live this time of year. True or false? Unbelievable. And it's, it's, it's amazing because it's all part of the water cycle. It's interesting that, that really the life that flows through the valley, it, it doesn't emanate from here. It descends to here, and, and that life begins on high. So as you know, once in a while it rains, but the snow really hits the mountains, and then eventually that life-giving source of water and nourishment flows through the streams and the creeks. It then flows down into the river and flows through the valley and brings life everywhere that it goes. And every time you see the river or you enjoy the seasons, I want you to remind yourself of this truth. God's love is like that. That God's love starts on high. And this is where 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21 is going to go today. So if you've got a Bible, go there. And if not, go to the fake Bible on your phone. Find 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. And here's what John's going to tell us, that God is love and that love comes from on high. It flows down from God. And he's going to tell us that it flows to the cross of Jesus And it flows to the Christian through the person, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit, that the love of God flows through the Christian so that we could love one another. And then the love of God flows from the church out to the world so that others who don't yet know the Lord Jesus would experience the love of God. And then the love of God would then culminate in the worship of God. And he says, in this, God's love is made complete just like the water that flows and evaporates and returns to on high that brings physical life to the valley. So God wants his love to flow through the valley so that there is also spiritual life. And that's what he means when he talks of the love of God and the command to love one another. So we'll start with the fact that love flows from God. Before God tells us to love, he tells us where to obtain that love. It's, it's not fair to tell you to give something that you've not received. And so, beloved, and let me just start right there. You are loved by God. Just, just sit in that for a moment. Just steep in that for a second. You're loved. Before God tells you what to do, he tells you who you are. Before he gives you any of his rules, he establishes his relationship. This is different than how our other relationships work. We have to earn someone's favor or approval. And you need to continue to earn it so that you can maintain the status of relationship. God's love is not like that. God's love is a parental love. God's love is a father's love. I could still remember the first time that my wife held each of our children. They had not yet said or done anything, just been born. And our heart for them was love. It was commitment. It was devotion. We couldn't love them anymore, and we wouldn't love them any less. God's love for you is a love like that. He will use these two concepts of identity, beloved and children of God, and he weaves them through the totality of 1 John. And he's talking about you and God's heart toward you and God's affection toward you. And some of you would say, well, you don't know what I've done. Doesn't matter. His love is bigger. It doesn't, you would say, well, you don't know how far I've run. Well, then you have not been paying attention to how fast he is. He's right on your heels. Right? You cannot unearn or outrun the love of God. I've got five kids, three boys, two girls, and they would tell you the story that when I wanted them to do something, particularly if it was something that I got an indication that they would not want to do, here's what I would do. I would look them in the eye. Well, right now my oldest son is six foot one, so if I want to look them in the eye, it's kind of hard. But when they were little, I would get down. I'm an old catcher with bad knees, and I would look at my kids in the eye. And I would have this simple little conversation in one form or another. Who, who am I? They'd say, you're, you're my dad. Okay. Who are, you? Who are you? Well, I'm your son, your daughter, your kid. How do I feel about you? And they would always say, you love me. You love me. My, my daughter, who was really poetic, she'd say, you love me bigger than the sky and deeper than the ocean. I said, yes, I do love you. I said, now, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you don't do it, how do I feel about you? They say, you'll still love me. Okay? 
Um, why do I tell you to do things? Because you love me. When I tell you to do something, is it good for you or bad for you? It's good for me. We'd have this long conversation. And then I would tell them, here's what I need you to do. Are you going to do that? And almost all the time, I had one of those sons. <laughs> but almost all the time, they would say, yes. And sometimes they would say, no. And on one occasion, my son looked at me and said, what happens if I don't do what you say? I said, I'm going to love you until you do it. You're God's kids. You're his beloved. You're his sons and daughters. He tells you who you are before he tells you what to do. He tells you about the relationship before he gives you his rules. You're beloved. What this means is obeying God is not something you have to do. It's something you get to do. It's not something that you do so that God will love you, but because he already does. Not so that God would receive you, but because he already has. Beloved, let us love one another. We're loved to love. For love is from where? Where do you get that? It's from God. If I told you I want raspberry sorbet, you say, I don't have that. I need to go find that. God tells you, give them love. You say, well, I don't have that. I got to find that. God says, I'll give that to you to give to them. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is what? Love. That's the big theme for the whole section. And this concept of the love, it's one of the mega themes of the whole Bible. And did you know it's quite unique to Christianity? If you believe in pantheism or panentheism or radical environmentalism or, or the worship of the earth, it's not personal and it's not love that marks their concept of spirituality. Some religions would say, in fact, that, uh, that God isn't loving at all. As a result, the result of that is war and terrorism and injustice and oppression and tyranny. And it's not, it's not a proposition of welcoming this God. It's the imposition of this God. Your view of God is the most important thing about you, in fact. It's the thing that determines not only how you see God, but how you see yourself, how you see everyone else, and how you see life is to be lived. And so knowing that God is love is incredibly important, so much so that 40 times in five chapters of this little letter, he's going to use the word love. And the man who writes it, he's between 80 and 100 years of age. And when he was a young man, he walked with the Lord Jesus, kind of like a kid brother. He was probably Jesus' nearest and dearest best friend. And he, we are told, is the one whom Jesus loved. And so when he talks of the love of God, he talks from a lifetime of experience in relationship with Jesus. Now, let me say this carefully because it's significant. The world in which we lived has inverted this so that what is said is not that God is love, but rather love is God. And then what happens, we make love into God, and then we create a definition of love, and then we judge God by our definition of love. Well, God can't say that that kind of behavior or identity or activity is unacceptable because after all, God is love. And what they mean is love is God. Now, what we don't begin with is a definition of love by which we judge God. We begin with God as the definition of love. This is incredibly important. What this means is that God is love. That means that everything that God does is love is infused and informed by his love. Some will come along and say, a loving God would never send people to hell. My answer is, a loving God must. I have five children. I love them with all of my heart. I have a home in which we live together. We have rules that we live by, including honoring authority and loving and serving one another. Let's say someone knocked on the door and said, I would like to live in your house. Well, what do you think of our rules? I disagree with all of them. What do you think of our authority where mom and I, we're leading this family? I, I reject all of that. What's your intent for my children? I hate them and I'd like to harm them. Can I move in? Answer? No. They'd say, that doesn't feel very loving. My kids in the living room would say, mm, we disagree. Feels quite loving to us. Thank you very much. God is a father. Heaven is his home. We are his children. Hell is for those who don't love the Father, don't want to abide by the rules, or care for the members of the family. 
if a loving God allowed his enemies to torment his children forever, that would not be loving. To create a separation so that his people and his enemies are separated, that is loving of his glory, that is loving of his children. Everything God does is infused and informed with love. Everything. And when it comes to the attributes of God, and that's what we're talking about, we talk about the love of God, the Bible speaks of God with a constellation of attributes. God is holy and just, and, and God is also loving and merciful, and there's this constellation of attributes of God. And here's what I want you to know. Dangerous, horrible things happen when we take one of God's attributes, we elevate it above the rest of God's attributes, and we treat it as if it alone was God. So for example, if you take the sovereignty of God that he rules and reigns over all and you just sort of let go of that balloon and you let that attribute of God sort of rise above all others, you end up with something called deism where God is far away and he doesn't have any intimate relationship with us. If you say that God is only wrath, well, then you end up hating people and destroying them because you don't have the love of God working in concert with the holiness of God. But when it comes to the attributes of God, here it tells us that God is love. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 15, he told us that God was holy. He says, here's his language, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That means that God is holy, God is perfect, God is pure, God is good. In fact, the attribute of God that is mentioned in the Bible more than any other attribute of God is the holiness of God. It's mentioned more than 800 times. And so what he's making in these two statements is God is holy and he's loving. Because he's holy, he can't change his own essence and nature and say that unholy sinful behavior is okay, but because he's loving, he wants to forgive us and embrace us, and so God's holiness causes him to hate what we have done, but God's love compels him to do something to remedy the problem that we have created in our relationship with him. This is a tremendous insight. If I can get you to understand that God loves you and what that love entails and means, it'll change your whole life, it'll change your relationship with God and one another, and here's why. When you don't understand that God loves you, there is a, a deep, profound appetite in your soul to be loved. And it's not a bad thing that in fact the God of the Bible is a God of love. Another way of saying that is that God of the Bible is Trinitarian. It's our Christian shorthand for one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, that they enjoy perfect union and communion, love and affection, adoration. Some say that God made us because he was lonely. God wasn't lonely. God didn't need anything. God didn't lack anything. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they share eternally love perfectly, unceasingly, and we were made by this God in the image and likeness of that God, meaning we were made to receive the love of God and we were made to love God back and to love others. Jesus says that's the summation of the whole teaching of the whole Bible, is to love God and to love people. And what happens when we have this deep need and we were made to be loved and to love, when that need is not met by God, what we do is we stop loving people and we start using people. Some of you, the biggest problem in your marriage is that you are looking at your spouse and in effect saying, I just need one thing of you, perfect, constant love. And then they fail. And you're disappointed and you're hurt because they weren't God. And what you were seeking from them is something that only he can provide. And that is perfect, constant love. And what this does, this causes us to stop loving people and start using people. This is why you'll find young women in abusive relationships with horrific guys. And you ask, why does she put up with that? Because she doesn't know the love of God. So she's looking to this man to meet that longing for love and she's willing to use him. And as a result, he is abusing. And so it's this cycle of using and abusing. It's not loving. 
Some people want this love from their children. They want their, this love from their spouse. They want this love from their parents. And it is only satisfied and met in God. And once that need is met, that God loves you perfectly and you are loved by God, then you can receive that love and you can stop using people to manipulate them to love you. You can just start loving them as God loves you. Some of you, this is very aggressive. You're very domineering and demanding. Others of you, it's very passive aggressive. You're very manipulative and controlling. But what it's trying to do, it's trying to use people to get the love need met. God is love. And if you belong to the Lord Jesus, you are beloved. And the love issue is settled. And now God's love is in you. And now God's love can begin to flow through you. And that's exactly where he's going to go. Let me give you a brief definition of love before we move to the next point. Love is selfless and it's sacrificial. It's selfless and it's sacrificial. We live in an age of self protection, self-esteem, self-help, self-glorification. Love is other-centered, not self-centered. In addition, love is sacrificial, not selfish. The world is filled with takers and few givers. Love gives. Love considers the other and it gives for the sake of the other. And oftentimes what we are thinking about is ourselves and we're orienting everyone and everything in our life toward ourselves. That's not loving. That's in fact very unloving. And so this is one of these words that gets very confused and corrupted in our culture. When people say, I love pizza, not like this. When people are sleeping and living together and they say, well, we love each other, that's not selfless or sacrificial. That's selfish. And that's taking, not giving. That's, that's actually not love. Well, if you love me, you'd let me do what I want. No, actually, that's not loving at all. Because, because love sacrifices for your well-being. And if I give you permission to self-destruct, that's actually not loving at all. So we have a clear definition of love that is based on the character of God, the attributes of God, the necessity of God. What does God look like? And then the question becomes, what does love look like? What does love look like? And then he tells us that love flows down from God and it flows through Jesus' cross. In this, the love of God was made manifest. It was made seen. Have you ever heard of something, but you've never seen it? And then you see it and you're like, oh, now I understand. Now I understand what they were talking. I'd never seen that. And then when I saw that, now I understand what they're talking about. What he's saying is, We've heard a lot about love, but where do you go to see what that really looks like? Where's it manifest? Where's it unveiled? Where's it on display? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. He tells us about three things, Jesus, and he tells us that Jesus is God's only son. Okay, this is incredibly important. Jesus is one of a kind. I won't get into all of the theological debate here. This is a significant understanding of Jesus. What some will try to do is to paint Jesus as one of the best or perhaps the best among us. So if you take sort of the Mount Rushmore of morality, well, there's Martin Luther King Jr. and Abe Lincoln and Mother Teresa and whomever else you aspire to admire. And then, oh, there's Jesus, he's one of the greats. No, he's not in a category of mere humanity. He's in a category unto himself. He's one of a kind, he's God's only son. Every one of us, we began at a moment in time. He is eternal, we're all created, he's creator. We all have an earthly father. He alone has a heavenly father that the first member of the Trinity, God the Father, sent his only son, one of a kind. There's nobody like Jesus. There's nobody in Jesus' category. There's no one alongside of Jesus. Never has been, never will be. He's unto himself. He sent his only son to show us what love looked like. You say, well, where, where do I go in Jesus' life? Well, he... He cared for widows, orphans, and those in need. He handed out food to those who were hungry. He healed those who were sick, and all of those were loving. But the thing that John speaks of most clearly, emphatically, is Jesus' cross. And John was there. Did you know this man was there? 
He was a young man at that time watching his friend Jesus be crucified. Having lived many, many decades in his whole life, he picks that one moment as the most significant unveiling of God's love in human history. Some people will say we should not talk about sin and death and wrath and hell and blood. We should talk about the love of God. And John says, we're talking about the same thing. That God's love is seen in Jesus' suffering. Because the cross is about what he calls propitiation. It's a word that appears four times in your Bible in the New Testament. And what it means is substitution. That God's holiness has to deal with our sin. And God's love means that he sends his son to suffer and die in our place for our sin. And so the holiness of God and the love of God, they kiss and they meet and they intersect literally at the cross of Jesus. And this is what the Bible says in other places. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You're at the great end zone, verse John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There is no understanding of love apart from the cross of Jesus and that was selfless and it was sacrificial. He substituted himself in our place for our sins. And let me tell you this, God can't love you any more than that. God can't love you any more than that. I have three sons. I could not fathom an enemy declaring war on me being arrested, tried, sentenced to death, showing up while they still hated me and saying, you know, I'm gonna take my son and he's going to trade places with you because I love my enemies so much I'm willing to sacrifice my own son. How many of you have a child that you would not sacrifice for your enemy? All right. When we see ourselves as sinners, enemies of God, all of a sudden the love of God explodes our mind. It's one thing to love someone who loves us. Jesus says that's very easy. After all, they have good taste, right? It's another thing to love someone who hates you. And when we sin, we hate God, we declare war on God, we shake our fist at God, we live in defiant opposition to God, and that means that God's love is not just for us who are undeserving. It means that God's love for us is for we who are ill-deserving of God's love. God can't love you anymore, and he won't love you any less. So the love of God comes down to the earth, it flows down at the cross of Jesus, and then it comes to Christians by the person, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, there it is again. Right, next time you see a mother holding a baby, think God loves me like that. Before the child has said or done anything, it starts with loving affection and devotion. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Okay, how many of you, how many of you live downstream somewhere here in the valley? Okay. Aren't you glad that they let the water go downstream as well? Aren't you glad that the whole valley gets to enjoy the water that flows? God's love is to flow like that. Every time you see the river, I want you to think of God's love. God's love is supposed to flow through the whole valley, and my heart and life is not to be a dam that prevents it from flowing downstream. That's what he's saying. If God has loved us, we need to love one another. He's speaking to ch church people. He's speaking to Christians. I tell you what, too, there's nothing worse than Christians fighting with Christians in front of non-Christians. You ever see terrorists attack terrorists? Well, you'll see Christians attack Christians. When Christians fight with Christians in front of non-Christians, everybody loses, nobody wins every single time. Now, what he doesn't say is Christians like one another. Are there any people you don't like? Yeah, I know them too. I agree with you. They're not likable people. I'm one of them. That's how I know who they are. That's my club, okay? It doesn't say Christians like one another. 
Here, what it doesn't say, Christians agree with one another. You ever met a Christian you didn't agree with? Yeah. If you don't like someone or you don't agree with someone, you can end up arguing and fighting and publicly attacking someone. And then instead he says, you know what? God doesn't force us to like each other. God doesn't force us to agree with one another, but he does command us to love one another. You say, well, how can I love them the same way that God loved you and the same way that God loves me? I don't think God looks at me and says, that Mark, he's likable. I don't like living with me. I can't imagine him living with me. I, God doesn't look down and say, I love Mark because he agrees with me. There are things that Mark believes that are wrong and he doesn't even know it yet. God chooses to love me even on the days that I make it very hard to like me or agree with me. God loves me. And what he's saying is, hey, since God has loved us, we need to love each other. And I would just add, even when you don't like one another or you don't agree with one another, that's actually when the love really gets tested. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. He's speaking of God the Father. He's invisible, immaterial. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. It makes the full circle. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. This is where your concept of God is the most important thing about you. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, perfect, eternal, unbroken union and communion. To say that God is love is another way of saying, as I said, that God is Trinitarian. And what happens is this perfect love between the Father, Son, and Spirit, it's made manifest, it's shown to the world, it's unveiled at the cross of Jesus. And then the love of God from the cross of Jesus is brought into the life of the believer by the person, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. What this means is now that the source of love lives in you. This is a well that never runs dry. This is where God can tell us to love one another and he provides an inexhaustible source of love. This is where God can tell us to love our enemies and we can love them not with a natural love but with a supernatural love because the source of love, the very presence of God, the very love of God, it takes up residence in the life of the believer. And really, here's what he's saying, that the love flows between the Father, Son, and Spirit. The love then flows down to the earth at the cross of Jesus. The love of God flows to us through the Holy Spirit, bringing the love of God to dwell in us. And that love needs to flow through us to other Christians. Are there any Christians you're embittered against, you haven't forgiven, you hate, you're jealous of, you're opposed to, you're maligning, attacking? If so, that's not loving. They live downstream and God's love is not just for you, it's to flow through you to them as well. And some of you would say, but they don't deserve it. Well, you didn't deserve it. Well, they're not very nice to me and God would say, I know how you feel. And as his love has flowed to us, it is to flow through us. And that's the mark of the true Christian is love. He then continues, um, love is to flow through us to non-Christians. So it's to flow out to the world. And when he uses this language of world, it's actually a complicated Greek word. I think it appears seven different variations in your New Testament. In this occasion of 1 John, it means culture that is opposed to God. And we'll unpack this in a moment. True or false, the culture in which we live is not really warm toward the Bible. If you don't believe me, take any cultural issue Go to social media and just post a clear verse about what the Bible says on that particular issue and then see if you get a lot of love in your comments. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. In fact, the culture that we're in is opposed to God. Christianity had a privileged place in the center of culture where at least the Bible and Christianity was respected, then it was pushed to the margins, and now actually it is seen as something offensive and intolerable, okay? The, the, the kingdom of God is in conflict with the cultures of the world. There is a battle between two kings and two kingdoms. We live in God's love, we are citizens of God's kingdom, but our residence is in this world that is opposed to God. What do we do? And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of what? The world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. 
So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected. It runs the full course. It is perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is also are we in this world. Here's what he says. God the Father sent his son into this world, this culture that is fundamentally opposed to the kingdom of God and to the word of God. True or false, Jesus loved the world. True. True or false, the world hated Jesus. True. I mean, falsely arrested, falsely accused, falsely tried, falsely condemned, wrongly murdered, openly, publicly, shamefully. And even as he's dying for the sin of his enemies to turn them into his family, Jesus loves. He doesn't argue. He doesn't fight. He says things like, Father, forgive them. Jesus loves. And now we who receive the love of Jesus are sent into the same world. The nations may change, but the spiritual forces behind them do not. You can love the world and be hated. And the question is, how will you respond? This is living as a missionary, right? A missionary is one who is from another kingdom and culture and king, and and they're bringing this message of reconciliation with their king and kingdom, right? We're citizens of God's kingdom. He is our father. He is our Lord. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're missionaries in this culture. And as we love and say things that we believe are loving and stand for things that we believe are loving, we will receive hate. And then this becomes our opportunity to demonstrate who our God is by loving, not agreeing, loving loving. And then if and when the question is asked, why do you love me? I hate you. I love you because I'm loved. I love you because God's love for me is pure and his love for you is pure and he has sent me here to love you. And the more that you revile me, it gives me a greater opportunity to love you because ultimately all of your hostility is toward him. It's toward him. See, when you take it personal, you make it personal. And a lot of the opposition that you and I will receive as believers, some of it is because we say and do things that we shouldn't, and I am certainly guilty of that, but sometimes there is suffering for righteousness sake. And you're being opposed, harassed, hated, despised, even rejected by family and friends, and some of you have experienced that. Not because what you believe is unbiblical, but because what you believe is biblical. Not because what you did was unloving, but because what you did was loving according to the God of the Bible. And that means you don't take it personal because when you take it personal, you make it personal and you realize, man, this is what happens when people live separated from the love of God. And there's a heartbreak apart from God's love changing me, I would feel and think and do as they. And I want God's love to flow through me because it's God's kindness that leads to repentance. And ultimately, if I can continue to share God's love with them, perhaps they'll come to know the God who loves them and his love will change them. How many of you were just fundamentally opposed to Christianity until God's love changed you? What Christian stood in front of your firing squad and just took it for a while? and loved you. And and Jesus sends us to be a little bit like that to the world. Love comes from God. It's demonstrated the cross of Jesus. It flows into the life of the believer by the Holy Spirit so that we can love one another in the church and that we love those who are in the world and then ultimately it flows back to God. 1 John 4, 18 through 21, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear just like The Holy Spirit casts out a demon, so it is love that casts out fear. For fear has to do with what? Punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. There's still work to be done. We love because he first loved us. This is critical. 
God loves us, we love him back. God initiates, we respond. We don't seek God, he seeks us. We don't call out to God, he calls out to us. Our seeking of God, our responding to God, our crying out to God is all in response to God going first. How many of you, a relationship is easier when the other person initiates? They come up, they introduce themselves, they extend their hand, they're warm, they embrace you, they invite you, they initiate. God initiates the relationship. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a what? He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have heard from him meaning from Jesus, whoever loves God must also love his brother. John is going back to an experience that he had as a young man when he was literally in the presence of Jesus and the question was asked to Jesus, Jesus, you know, this is a big book. There's a lot of rules. Boil it down. We need a Cliff Notes version. 600 laws just in the first five books of the Old Testament. Jesus says, love God and people. You do that, you're not gonna commit adultery. You do that, you're not gonna steal, covet, murder, lie. We're gonna take care of everything with love. Love God, love people. And he puts them together as one commandment in two parts, two sides of the same coin. And what he's saying is if a Christian or a professing Christian says, I love God, I just hate them. What he's saying is it doesn't work like that. Who are you bitter against? Who have you not forgiven? Who do you hate? Who are you speaking ill of? Who are you seeking to punish in some way? Who, if they failed, if they were harmed, it would cause you joy? What he's saying is, you can't say, God loves me, and I can't love them because God love, God's love is supposed to come to you. It's supposed to flow through you to them. See, everybody in your life, they live downstream. And God's love is to flow through you to them. To them. And if I can get you to understand what John is driving at, I have a tremendous opportunity today to change your whole life. To change your relationship with God to change your relationship with others. And what John is driving at is that all of the decision-making in our life, it really flows from two sources, love, God, or fear, me. Fear has to do with what? Punishment. You're going to hurt me. You're going to defeat me. You're going to take from me. Okay, I, I want you to look at your life and ask, am I making my decisions from fear? Fear causes us to be false prophets, to prophesy doom into our life that God has not spoken. Fear in the mind leads to anxiety in the body. The reason that many people are stressed and depressed is because they're living in light of fear in the mind that causes anxiety in the body. Fear will cause you to withdraw because love is offensive. It moves toward people. Fear is defensive. It withdraws from people. Some of you have made inner vows, things like, I will never let, me, I will never let anyone hurt me like that again. And what you're saying is, I will never get close enough for anyone to love me ever again because love takes a risk. And fear is all about not hurting, and as a result, there's no risking. Some of you, your fear works itself out kind of in a sports business combination where you're all about winning. If you're all about winning, you're never about loving. Okay, look at the cross of Jesus. Was he winning or loving? He was loving. It, was, it does not look like he is winning. But his highest value was loving, not winning. See, we live in a culture that's all about the winners. 
and especially you guys, you take that jock mentality into the business world and it's all about winning. It's not about loving. Sometimes loving means losing so that the other is blessed and benefited. Fear has to do with punishment. Who are you scared of? What are you afraid of? Every relationship that's based on fear, it's unhealthy at its core. Some of you, you hold your relationships together through threats. You better or all. Some of you parent out of fear, not out of love. You threaten the children, not just with punishment, but but wrath. Not just consequence to teach them right from wrong, but your own form of crucifixion, some sort of cross you're gonna hang them up on if they don't obey. Some of you threaten your spouse. If you don't, then I will fill in the blanks. You threaten, you dominate, you control, you manipulate. It's all fear-based. Some of you fear God, and the only reason you even make an effort at Christianity is because you live in terror of God. God saved me at the age of 19. I was a college freshman. I can tell you this. I have never once had a thought of fear that I was going to hell since I met the Lord Jesus. I'm 45. My feet have never hit the ground on any morning. And the thought entered my mind, I might go to hell. You know why? Fear has to do with punishment and Jesus was already punished on the cross in my place for my sins. That means that the wrath of God is satisfied and the love of God is given and my relationship with God, quite frankly, is not motivated by fear. It's not. I don't worry about going to hell, do you? Then you don't understand the love of God. Is your obedience to God primarily motivated by you being scared of God and you just don't want him to get angry at you and hurt you? Then you don't understand God. We've all got things that we're afraid of and some of them we should be because not everyone is safe and sometimes life is dangerous. I had a list of things, quite frankly, that I was afraid of and almost all of them happened to me in a short period of time. And I'm fine because the love of God never left me. When the Bible says, you know, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I wish I could have booked a flight over the valley of the shadow of death. Right? I would have been in the overhead bin even happily. <laughs> Any way to fly over the valley of the shadow of death. There are things that we are afraid of. There are valleys of death and shadows that we have to walk through. But if God's love is secure, then so are we. I want to unburden you from your fears. You can't make your decisions out of love and fear. It's love or fear. I want you to understand that if you are not a Christian, you have much to be fearful of. That you have sinned against a holy and righteous God, that you have neglected the offering of his own son. You've, you've lived a life separated from God. You've, you've not availed yourself to all that he has given to you. You've rejected God's love and you've, you've decided that he is not your father and the church is not your family. And as a result, you're living in a place that you should have fear. And so you need to give your sin to Jesus so that his punishment would be for you, that he would take your place of punishment and that you would take his place of beloved. And then once you're in that place, it transforms your relationship with God. I grew up in a neighborhood that didn't have many dads and the couple of dads that were there, quite frankly, were pretty bad dads. They were violent, angry. I grew up in a poor neighborhood, a rough neighborhood. 
I can still remember I was a, I was a little boy. I don't know, maybe six, eight, ten. I don't know how big I was. I was somewhere down here. And I remember uh, there was a girl who was one of my friend's sisters, and um, her dad walked up to her, and his hand just sort of glided toward her. She flinched and recoiled and took steps back at just the presence of her father's hand. As a little kid, I, I remember that just struck me. I thought, she doesn't, she doesn't feel safe with her dad. Whenever that hand comes out, it's punishment. It's fear. So I, I, I made a, a vow to God when I was a new Christian that if he would ever bless me with children, that, that when I extended my hand, they would not flinch or recoil in fear because this would not be associated with punishment. So I tested it again yesterday. I've got five kids. We were outside playing croquet. One way to be sanctified is to play <laughs> croquet. I put out my hand. My 12-year-old daughter, she was a couple steps away. She smiled. She walked over. She put her hand on my, she put her face on my hand. I tried it with my sons. My son is six foot one. I put my hand out. He had to lean down. He put his hand in, his head in my hand, and I kissed him on top of the head. I'm not a perfect father, but he is. He's a loving father. He doesn't want your relationship with him to be predicated on fear of punishment because Jesus already took care of that. Now, some of you were raised in really religious homes where fears and threats were used to get you to obey. And if it's not from the heart, it's not true obedience. It's just like training a dog. It's not an act of worship. It's just to avoid punishment and to get treats. And the highest motivation is love. Love will get you to do things that fear cannot get you to do. Amen? Because fear is all about self-preservation and self-protection, and love is about self-giving and selflessness. That's why a soldier will do a lot, but a mother will do more. People who say that you need to live in terror of God, they're trying to get you to obey and they don't understand that true obedience flows from a heart that understands the love of God and, and obeys God, not because you have to, but because you get to, not so that he'll love you, but because he already does, not so that he'll have a relationship with you, but because he already has. And it's the love of God flowing through you by the power of the Holy Spirit that causes you to become more like Jesus by loving God and loving others. And I just, I feel today that there is a great burden on some of you. Your whole life has been driven by fear and the decisions you've made have not been life-giving. You're lonely, your life is confusing, it doesn't make a lot of sense because, because it's not been driven by love. God loves you. I want you to receive that love today. I want that love to flow in you and through you. And I want all the decisions that you make to be done in love. And when you make a mistake or a bad decision or commit a sin, I want you to realize that God is not the one you need to run from because he's going to punish you. He's the one you run to because he's going to help you. He loves you.